Hi, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you so much to all those on the line today. We're so happy to be able to speak with you. I'm Emily Boyd Storman, and I'm the CEO of the Arthritis National Research Foundation, and I'm honored to be talking with you all today. I'm waiting for hopefully our board of directors chair to join me, though he is across seas and might be a little detained. But we're excited today to talk with you about the year in review and look ahead to the new year that we have. We just announced our latest cohort of scholars. Uh, as you can see and as we'll review, they're an impressive group of scientists who are working tirelessly on new and innovative projects that are looking to improve the lives, like yourself, of those that are affected by arthritis and related autoimmune disease. We also just finished our fiscal year on April 1st, and we ended in a very, very solid financial position, ensuring that we were able to support a number of scholars this year at a number of uh, academic institutions. One of those, in fact, I had the chance to meet yesterday, Dr. Ruth Napier at uh, the VA hospital in Portland. We were able to visit her in her lab and see all the great work that she's doing. With the number of people increasingly being impacted by arthritis. We now know that about one in four Americans is living with the disease. There's no better time than for us to continue to support the research of this very important cause and to share that work with all of you today. As I said, we're gonna take a, a quick look back at the year in review, and then we'll look ahead to what we have planned uh, coming up in the next coming months and, uh, and more to follow. Of course, we'll take questions throughout the time, so please feel free to chat those in, and we'll get to those as soon as we can. So moving forward, I wanna kind of start with looking back at some of the programs that we were able to, to start with last year. Um, and starting with our Researcher Spotlight Series, this was a new program that I know many of you were able to attend, and uh, it really was a, an innovative idea that came out of uh, the work of our staff to reach out to our researchers and to our community and get them together to talk about the impressive work that they're doing. This five-part webinar series looked at um, not only individual disease states like lupus and osteoarthritis, but gave our scholars and our alumni the chance to, uh, to come and talk about their work and how it's impacting lives now and what they're hoping to accomplish. We will be doing that program again this fall, so please stay tuned. We'll talk about some dates of that coming up and make sure that you guys are all uh, looped into when that's happening as well. Uh, in addition, we were so happy to have our first researcher uh, symposium. This is a program we've been wanting to do for a number of years, and with COVID delays, weren't able to do it in person. Um, and this year was the first year we could get together. So we brought uh, in a number of our alumni and current scholars and members of our scientific advisory board who had the chance to present to their colleagues on their data and really talk about possible collaboration, share the work that they're doing in their labs, um, and see all of the exciting work that our scientific advisory board members are doing as well. Uh, we also awarded over, uh, over $1.6 million in research grants in our FY22 year um, to the tune of 16 uh, recipients throughout the country studying various diseases that affect those living with arthritis and autoimmune. We're very excited to talk about our new cohort as well, uh, and we'll get to that in a minute. In addition, we continue to see just great success with the work that our alumni are doing, and we're very, very proud of a number of our researchers who had uh, wonderful published papers come out this last year. Um, many like Dr. Michael Paley and Dr. Ray Zhu, who continue to publish on topics that have uh, on the effects of COVID-19 and the arthritis and autoimmune related community. Uh, we've seen many media and mainstream publications come out of our research and scholars work. Many members of our scientific advisory board and current and alumni scholars also published data uh, related to COVID-19, um, as well as the continue the work that they're doing, uh, looking at new mechanisms of action uh, and, uh, and new therapies. Also want to highlight um, our own Dr. Utz, who's at uh, Stanford University, a member of our scientific advisory board. Him and his lab have done amazing work on vaccine bi biology. Uh, and so has Dr. Michelle Kallenberg and her lab that continue to do innovative work in lupus and have been published many times over. Uh, also one of our current scholars, Dr. Charles Chan, uh, was published many times this last year for some really innovative work that he's doing on regenerative stem cell research. 
And lastly, I want to highlight um, our own Dr. Betty Diamond, who was elected to the National Academy of Sciences uh, just this last spring, which is a, a huge honor uh, for, for a researcher and for a member of our board. And we could not be more proud of, uh, of her and others who serve in this capacity. Of course, none of this is possible without all of our wonderful partners and supporters. Um, and for us, that's a number of folks, right? That's our industry partners. That's our foundation partners. Um, it's our regular in everyday donors like you, folks that are impacted by these diseases and continue to give, knowing that you're making a difference in the lives of our researchers. You know, each year, our supporters ensure that we're able to continue the important work of the foundation. Um, we received a very special gift this year from a longtime supporter who was able to establish four named gifts in honor of valiant women who have been affected by arthritis. It's really a state and plan giving support like this that has enabled us to do the work and sustain us for so many years. Um, as you know, there's so much more to be done, but we're so grateful for the support up to this point. And of course, want to highlight, you know, all of the people that go into working at the foundation. It's 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 not just me; it's our entire staff. It's uh, the work of our scientific advisory board members who spend time reviewing our grants and who spend time uh, going and developing policy and procedures for our grant process. And it's our volunteer board of directors who spend time working on our bylaws, our policies, who build our budget and give us direction for the year. All of that goes into making what is hopefully a successful uh, plan ahead for us. And one of the most proud accomplishments I have to say over the last year has been the creation and adoption of our new strategic plan. So over the last year, many members of our board of directors, our scientific advisory board and staff came together and developed a five-year plan. It's by far our most ambitious plan to date, but certainly achievable and one we're excited to share with you. So our, our plan really, um, I like to say, breaks down in a couple of areas. Goal one through three is the work that we're already doing now, just at an elevated level. And it really gives us an opportunity to expand not only our reach and uh, the amount of folks that we're reaching in our community, but also gives us the opportunity to hopefully award more research grants um, and really support more of this work that we all know is so needed to develop new therapies and new treatments for those who are suffering. Goal one really um, breaks us down into a pretty easy synopsis that we want to grow our revenue. So over the next five years, we have a goal to double our annual revenue, and this will come from increasing our partnerships with our major donors, our corporate and family foundations, um, and our individual donors. It really gives us an opportunity to expand our reach and research grants once we're able to do that. Goal two is around increasing our research. We took a really hard look at um, at what our current research grant pro uh, program looked like and how it could improve. And we did a number of surveys with not only our scientific advisory board members and former scholars and alumni, uh, but also our community. And we asked, you know, what could we improve on? And a number of folks said, we wanna see a larger dollar amount being awarded every year. As we know, inflation is hitting and affecting all of us. And that for our scholars means increased cost for salary, increased supply costs, and that's affecting their ability to do their projects. So one of the ways that we wanna help at the foundation is to increase the research grant amount from what is now um, the opportunity to earn up to $200,000 for two years to $250,000. So an increase of that project of $50,000 and really give them the full 24 months. So we'll keep all of the good stuff of getting a progress report in, having that analyzed and reviewed to make sure they're making significant progress on their work, but really giving them the opportunity to have a little bit more time and a little bit more dollars to accomplish what they're hoping to in their research aims. And goal three is really about our community and what we know we need to do, continue to engage all of our wonderful supporters who listen to our webcasts, who participate in our symposium, uh, who read our chronicle, open our emails and get to us annually. We wanna make sure that we're providing all the resources that make sense for you and for our scholar community. And we'll continue to do that and increase those efforts throughout the next several years. And finally, our sort of out of the box idea comes uh, in goal number four, which for us is about accelerating discovery. And when we went about interviewing a number of our former scholars and our patient community, something that came up really was a gap in 
what do we do for all of uh, all of the folks who are still living with this disease and haven't yet found a therapy that works for them. As we know, that's many of us suffering day to day without a therapy or many therapies that could help. So we want to see what we can do. And we thought, let's explore uh, a venture side of our organization and look at possibly helping to accelerate and bring new therapies to market sooner uh, than is happening now. So it wouldn't take away from the work that we are doing every day. It really just gives us the opportunity to think about new ways that we could partner and new ways that we can engage so that, for example, if we had a scholar uh, who had a therapy that was close to being something that could be produced and brought to the market for patients, we could help them accelerate that project. So it's an exciting and innovative idea that we're looking forward to. And, uh, and we'll certainly explore it over the next five years and, and see what we can do. And a little picture from our strategic plan. Uh, I think you'll see all of our board members. In case you haven't seen us, we all were able to get together in person and uh, take the time to think about what we wanted to accomplish over the next five years. And I'll stop there for any questions that might have come in before we go through any of the in-depth conversation on the plan as we go through some of those bullets. So checking that text if anything has come in. So a question about the Venture Initiative and if it will change the ANRF. So good question and hopefully no, <laughs> except for, for the better. You know, we really want to um, actually just look at expanding what we're doing and how we are helping the patient community and our researchers. So there is a gap in, in the time that it takes for something to be developed and then to come through the clinical trial process and to be brought to market. And so for us, um, we really wanted to see, can we as a foundation play a role in that? It won't at all affect our day-to-day -day work in terms of the grants that we're awarding, the work that we're doing for our community, it would really be separate work that we can look at and see, is this a possibility to make a difference? There's many other organizations who have done similar work in their disease states. So we know it's possible. We just need to figure out if it's right for our organization uh, and then we'll go from there. Great question though, thanks for asking. So breaking down kind of each of these, uh, each of these strategic plan goals, you'll see again with goal number one, um, a pretty ambitious goal of doubling our revenue, which is um, hopefully gets us to the five to $10 million mark by the end of what we call fiscal year 27. We operate on an April 1st to March 31st fiscal year. So as confusing as it is, we're technically in fiscal year 23 right now. Everything we do is talking about 2023. Uh, and with a goal to bring in a little over $3 million in revenue. So we certainly think it's achievable to get to this five to 10, to 10 million by the end of FY27, but it's gonna take work and it's gonna take um, the work of our staff and the work of our partners and our committed donors to ensure that we're, we're getting what we need to. Next slide. So as we look at increasing our research efforts, as I talked about, this is really about making sure that what we're doing is in line with where the industry is telling us we need to be, where our researchers are telling us they need to be. And part of this is really working to increase the amount of dollars that we're giving out. It's really about looking at a couple of different avenues to get to new researchers and to get to new scholars and making sure that when we are opening up our grant process and reviewing our applications that we are seeing a diverse an inclusive set of uh, applicants that are coming to us and awarding to. I mean, we want to make sure that our scholar base is as diverse um, as those who are affected by this disease. And so making sure that what we're doing is in line with, um, with what the standard practices are that the NIH follows and other organizations as well. Next slide. And of course, goal number three, as I said, is around engaging communities. And that's really about these strategic relationships and partnerships with our community, with our patients and with our scholars. Um, as, as we continue to grow and add more programs, you know, the programs like our five-part webinar series, um, and of course, some of these other programs that 
all of our community is invited to. It's really a way for all of us to collaborate and to learn best practices and see what we can be doing to help one another. And then of course, our venture program. Um, we will spend the next year uh, working through kind of the ins and outs and discovery phase of this venture program. So really looking at best practices from other organizations who have done this in a successful way, who will continue to have success and have been able to bring new products and therapies for their community to the market. Um, our goal is to make a decision, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, if not by next year, we'll give ourselves some time to really make sure this works for our organization. And, uh, and this is something that our board and our members want to move forward with. Um, after that, if it's a go, we'll start the work of fundraising and start to find those venture philanthropists that want to be involved and engaged in this kind of work. Uh, and then we'll be able to hopefully start that as well. One more question looks like just came in. Um, how much of our donations go to research versus administration costs? Um, great question. So as we talk a little bit about, you know, the dollars that go out to our research, um, it comes up a lot with how much, if someone gives money actually goes to research and how much goes um, to other programs, right? So that includes all of the things that we need to continue to maintain our our day-to-day -day work and that could be anything from staff salary to um, computers to running our chronicle um, of course uh, putting on programs like a web series we're very fortunate that we're able to keep our costs down and the majority of our dollars raised go to research. So we're unique in that way. A lot of organizations look a little different, um, but we call all of the other overhead and we like to keep our overhead down. And in an average year, about 85 cents to every dollar spent or every dollar raised goes uh, to goes to our research programs. So um, it's a really great, level to stay at and we aim every year to make sure that the majority of our dollars that folks are donating go specifically towards research um, and that's something that we've been able to do for over 50 years and we'll continue to do that as we grow and expand into uh, into new and innovative areas as well. Any other questions? Questions on the accelerator program or anything else we can answer on uh, before we move on to our scholars. Okay, well, moving on to our, now to our new scholars, I'm excited to present and announce our 2022 to 2023 cohort. Uh, this current year, we awarded 19 scholars uh, a grant, which is the most that we have ever awarded. We're very, very grateful to the support of all of our funders and, and to our scientific advisory board who spent many hours reviewing the number of applications that we received and uh, triaging them, spending time ranking them, and then of course, bringing them to our board of directors for approval. These 19 scientists come from all over the country uh, with diverse backgrounds and diverse interests in all types of arthritis and autoimmune. You can see by the slate that we've put up, there's a number of folks looking not only at rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, but lupus, gout, all of the diseases that are affected um, by our community and that are really important because so many of them don't have very viable treatments. And the projects that they're doing are not only innovative, but are ones that are hopefully going to change the, the landscape for our community in the very near future. And uh, in, in addition to the 10 second year recipients, uh, excuse me, 11 second year recipients, we awarded eight new projects. All of our second year recipients, we were actually able to award them $125,000. This was a um, a really big jump from our normal $100,000, but something we felt was really important because of the rising cost of supplies, um, the salary costs that have been rising, and, and some of the hurdles that our researchers have faced over the last couple of years because of the COVID-19 pandemic. As you all can imagine, many of them had to deal with lab closures. Some had to deal with the loss of supplies. Many had to deal with the loss of staff who for a number of reasons, had to be let go or weren't able to come back to their lab. 
And it's been a real hurdle and a real struggle for our folks to continue to do their work. But I'm very proud to say that all of them are on track to complete their projects and have made significant progress over the last couple of years. And I think you'll see that in not only our uh, first year recipients, but our second year recipients and, and some of the work that they're doing and, and the upcoming publications that they have. I want to just say thank you to uh, all 19 of these because you know this is what we do and this is who we are as an organization. I know many of them are on the call today, so thank you for being on the call. Um, all of them are so excited to be a part of this organization and, and to our community out there, thank you for welcoming them and for showing them the important work that they're doing. I encourage you all to take a look at our website, curearthritis.org, and read about the work that they're doing and what their projects are that they have planned for the upcoming year. Their work is so very interesting and innovative, and this is really the top of the top and the, uh, the best of the best when it comes to, re to scientists that are studying this work, and we're very honored to call them uh, this year's cohort. So a little bit about how we how we fund our grant recipients. It is a pretty lengthy process, believe it or not. Uh, it starts in November when we open up our grant application every year. Uh, what we do is essentially not only open it up to our community, but to all of the academic community and encourage uh, folks who are what we call postdoc early career researchers to apply. We have a number of policies and procedures on our website that in order to qualify for our grants. Um, and once they are able to be qualified, they can go on and submit an application. Those applications are due typically in the middle of January. And on any given year, we receive between 50 to 75 applications from some of the, the leading academic centers and some of the best scholars of the world. We then take that opportunity to what we call triage them. So we make sure that everyone is qualified and everybody has the opportunity to um, review an application. Those are divvied out to our members of our scientific advisory board. Uh, each member reviews several applications and ranks them and scores them based on an NIH, that's the National Institute of Health, scoring system. So we follow their, their system and their model pretty closely. We then all get together as a scientific advisory board and discuss the top ranked applications and score them again. At the end of a very long day, a very long but rewarding day, we have a slate and uh, we review that slate and then present it ultimately to our board of directors. Our board of directors is, is not only our governing body, but they also um, play a really important role in approving our grant spend and our grant allocation every year. That typically happens in the spring and about the March, April timeframe. And then we begin the process of notifying uh, our scholars. I like to say it's the best day of the year. I get to call people and let them know that they have received one of our grants and uh, the reactions are, are priceless. And it's very rewarding to be able to let someone know that they have this funding, which in many opportunities is life changing and affords them the option to continue the work that they love so much. Uh, and then we go through the process of really working through with our administration and uh, coming up with agreements. And then we get to announce it to you all. That typically happens in the June timeframe. So all in all, we're working uh, for a large time of the year to come up with our cohort for the year. And then of course, share that with you all. So we're just in the, last, the later stages of announcing. And then of course, we'll get ready this fall for our new application as well. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, our financial sustainability and, and what that means in, in really a turbulent time. I think for many of us, we're really heavily impacted by the rising costs um, around us. And, and for a lot of us, that means maybe I can't afford to give right now, or maybe I can give a little bit more right now. It's those decisions and it's those folks who continue to give to us that has really sustained us for the over 50 years we've been a foundation. But it's not only our individual donors, it's our family foundations, it's our industry partners, and it's folks like Miss Louise Dawson who gave this year, who set up a legacy uh, for those to come after her. 
We're so grateful for that continued support, which puts us in a really strong financial position and it really ensures that year over year, we can continue to fund the best scholars. However, we know every year that we leave many scholars on the table and aren't able to award every single application that we want. Unfortunately, there is a limit and we run out of money and say we have to cut it off here. But we don't want to do that. We want to be able to say these are truly the 20 or 25 most innovative projects and we want to award all of them and to feel that we can do that. We'll need your help to get there. Uh, and we encourage you to contact us, but also just really appreciate those who continue to stay with us and give and you know, listen to the work that we're doing, who engage with us on a regular basis. And uh, it takes a whole village and a whole community. And I, and I hope you all know that you're a part of a really special community and we're very, very happy to have you as well. We've got a couple of important uh, campaigns coming up. Of course, we just concluded Arthritis Awareness Month, which is the month of May, and we're gearing up for Juvenile Idiopathic Arthritis Awareness Month, which happens in July. Um, as we all know, unfortunately, arthritis impacts uh, not only you know not only our everyday, but also our our children as well. It can be very debilitating and very devastating um, to the pediatric community. And so this is a month where we bring awareness to that. We encourage folks to give specifically um, in support of JIA research. You'll see that we have a number of scholars who work in that area trying to help this community that's very underserved in a lot of ways and, and find the right type of research and the right type of projects uh, that will move the needle forward. Next slide. So what's ahead? Obviously a lot still going on. So of course we have our researcher web webinar series again. We like to call it Webinar Wednesdays because it'll take place um, for five consecutive weeks this fall. And uh, we're starting uh, October 5th and then we'll go to the beginning of November. We are uh, still working on finalizing what our topics will be, but they'll be similar to last year. Uh, we did a topic last year on osteoarthritis and one on lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. So look for those dates to come out. Our webinars that we produced last year are still available on our website and are still um, something for you to go back and listen to. They're free. You can download them and listen at any time. It's really an opportunity to hear from our scholars about some of the innovative work that's happening today in each of these disease areas. What's the real-time work that's taking place? Uh, what does this mean for us? And how you know, can we translate that eventually into therapies that are going to help us? So please uh, be on the lookout for that coming up here the later summer, we'll start to announce registration and then also um, again, promote last year. So you can go on and hear from that cohort as well. And of course, we're very excited to continue our research symposium. So year two will actually be held in Boston. We're gonna take a little road trip and head to the East Coast where so many of our scholars, members of our scientific advisory board members are and bring together a current, our current cohort. Now we're very excited this year to have all 19 of them in person presenting on their data, as well as members of our scientific advisory board, our industry partners, and other members from the academic community to come together to talk and collaborate on the work that's being done. This is obviously a huge undertaking for the organization and for our staff, but it's so needed and it really provides the opportunity for our researchers to meet others in their field doing this work, to collaborate on potential projects, um, and hopefully down the line could lead to career development opportunities, um, new mentors, and, and many more. So we're very excited that will take place in March. Um, that always coincides with our scientific advisory board meeting where we review our grants. So a lot going on. It's a great opportunity um, to participate. If you're in the local area, you can come in person. Uh, it's very science heavy, but it uh, makes sense to those who understand uh, the ins and outs of what we're dealing with every day. And so I encourage you to attend if you're there. 
And of course, uh, our strategic plan. We still have a lot of work to do. We're just uh, barely in year one. So we've got four more years of that. You'll continue to hear about this in our on in our publications, in our emails. You know, our strategic plan is our driving force of everything that we do. And every business plan we put together aligns back to the work we want to accomplish in our strategic plan. So you'll continue to hear about that, continue to hear about the progress that we're making, not only biannually, but at the end of every year as well in our annual report. Um, of course, we've got fundraising and we've got work to do. We've got funds to raise. We want to make sure that all the scholars uh, that we want to award money to are awarded. So that's an ongoing for us. We never stop fundraising and we never stop um, talking about the importance of giving to the foundation. Of course, we want to continue to support our researchers um, and the research that they're doing, you know, highlight the work, their publications, uh, their data that's come out, what have they accomplished, Many of them work so hard uh, without a lot of recognition, and we want to make sure that we are we are tooting their horn and telling the community about the great work that they're doing, continuing to promote their, their professional development by giving them speaking opportunities, engaging with our patient community, and engaging with the research community. We're going to continue to prioritize DEI and look at uh, what do we need to, to do to make sure that all of the initiatives that we do are inclusive uh, to a di diverse population. So not only the hiring that we do, but everything to the makeup of our board of directors and of course our grant process. We know that this is not only most important for all other organizations and what's happening in science, but really important for our work as well in the community that we support because arthritis affects everybody and it doesn't matter what kind of background you have, everybody is affected. And we need to make sure that all that we're doing is inclusive of supporting our community. Of course, uh, our board of directors is, uh, is really the backbone of our organization. And, uh, and we're always looking to add new members to our board, uh, folks that come from different geographic locations, have diverse uh, backgrounds, professional backgrounds. Uh, we really want to ensure that our board is a representation of our community and is as diverse as our community is as well. So continuing to add to our board of directors, um, reviewing uh, new members that could be added over the year to that and to our scientific advisory board. And then of course, uh, continuing to build a sustainable organization. You know, we want to remain one of the top 1% of nonprofits. And what that means is we have such a solid foundation and such a stable financial organization that we have been noted uh, to be one of the top 1% of all four-star charity navigator organizations. We have held the distinction of a four-star charity navigator organization for many, many years, and we want to keep that. It gives our donors confidence that we're doing what we should be doing, that our money is being spent where it should be, and that we feel confident, the board feels confident, and of course our community feels confident in the work that we're doing and the progress that they're seeing from us. So we've got a lot of work to do, but it's certainly doable, and we're excited to continue to work with you all and share the work over the, over the coming months as well. Is that our last slide, or do we have one more slide? We have another slide, but do you want to take a question? Sure, go ahead. Yes, I'm seeing a question from about the SAB. Happy to talk about our SAB. We call it our Scientific Advisory Board or our SAB. Our scientific Advisory Board is made up of um, mainly physician scientists. So these are folks who still do a lot of science in their own labs. Some just do science and some also see patients in clinic. Uh, and they are seasoned professionals, many of whom actually were recipients of an ANRF award years ago um, and have progressed mightily in their career and are really pioneers in each of their disease states. They range from experts in lupus to osteoarthritis to rheumatoid arthritis, pediatric rheumatology, our SAB is, is a diverse group of people make, that make up each of these different disease states that we try to fund and uh, try to help. Uh, they come from all over, the, all over the United States, from a number of academic institutions. Um, 
we really work with them to understand the makeup of the organization and to spread the word of what we're doing. They're a very elite group of, of members. We're honored to have them all. They uh, work, they do all of their volunteer work for us for free, which is amazing. And uh, we couldn't do what we do without them. They're really our, our medical brain of the organization. They guide and drive all of the medical decisions that we make, the research that we fund, the priority areas that we set when it comes to our grant recipients. And uh, we're very honored. I encourage you, we'll throw up a link to where they live on our website. Take a look at each of them. Um, most notably, as I just mentioned, Miss Betty Diamond uh, received, uh, was elected into the National Academy of Science, which is very, very, very rare. And this is the kind of caliber of folks that we have on our board. So we're, we're very excited uh, that, we able, that we're able to highlight them. Um, question, what's the best piece of advice you can give to researchers when they're applying for a grant? Great question. We do field a number of questions during the application period, um, many of which are inquiring sort of around our general policies and procedures. And um, I would say the best advice is A, make sure you qualify, read, read through all that we have to offer, um, and really take your time to put together a thoughtful application. Oftentimes we see people that might just barely miss the mark because they didn't actually fulfill many of the categories of the application. Um, and it can be difficult. It can be difficult. It's time consuming, um, but it's it's very worth it. I mean, this is these awards are life changing for a number of folks. And so um, we certainly encourage those who are interested in applying to reach out to the foundation. This year, we'll also be doing a webinar, a, a basic how to apply from one of our former scholars and members of our scientific advisory board that will give some tips and tools, things that they look for as a reviewer and things that they found helpful when they were applying for their grant. Um, so if we have researchers or potential scholars on the, on the line, um, I encourage you to look out for that. It'll probably come out in the late fall right before our um, application opens. And it'll be a great opportunity to ask questions, but also get some of those tips about uh, what they're looking for and what you can really do to move your application to the top uh, of the pile as well. Other questions that have come in? Oh, question about who are your key staff members uh, at ANRX? So we are, I like to say, a small but mighty team. Um, we're made up of myself, our Director of Marketing and Communications, Jen Casey, our Director of De Development, Karen Williamson, our Director of Operations, Missy Hanover, and our Executive Assistant, Charlotte Ramey. Uh, so with that, we're able to accomplish just about everything we need to do. We all wear many hats and are able to uh, perform the daily duties of the mission, uh, though we would love um, to add more staff. It's part of our goals and part of our strategic plan over the next five years is to take a look at the needs of the organization, not only in terms of our researchers and our grants and our dollars, but what kind of infrastructure do we need as a, as a foundation to ensure our success and to ensure that we have what we need to reach those goals. And so we will be adding a few key positions over the coming years that will really help us to enhance and streamline the work that we're doing to support our community and to make sure that we're accomplishing all of the goals that we have. And I know that we still have a, a number of our new scholars and members of our cohort on the call. Um, and I just wanna uh, say how very proud we are of all of them and how much we're here to support them and, and really are invested in your success. We talk a lot about the underlying mission of our organization, which is really about supporting the work of our scholars and making sure that they have successful careers. And that's that's incumbent on us as a foundation to give them the tools that they need to be successful to ensure that they have long careers in this field. We of course want everyone to stay in the research field so that they can continue to come up with innovative ideas and projects that will really improve the lives of those living with the disease. So I can't thank you all enough for, for the time and energy, uh, for being a part of the foundation and, uh, and for the work that you do. It's, it is truly amazing when I have the opportunity to sit one-on-one -on -one with a scholar and hear about the work that they're doing in their lab and how much it impacts the daily lives of our of our community. So thank you to all of all of you who are there and listening in. Really appreciate it. One more slide it looks like. 
Perfect. So again, I just wanted to follow up and say thank you to all of you for participating, for being here, listening to us talk today, for your time, for, for all the connection that you have to the foundation. I am truly humbled every day as I sit in this seat and I meet the wonderful people that support us, who have been supporting us for so many years, um, those who continue to persevere with their disease, despite the fact that we uh, still have a long way to go uh, in terms of therapies and treatments that can help us. I'm so humbled when I meet each of our scholars and see how very interested they are in the success of the foundation and in the work that they're doing. So if you excuse me, haven't had a chance, I encourage you to sign up for our weekly e newsletter. It's called The Chronicle. We offer a lot of information in there on a week-by-week -week basis, not only for our scholars, but for our community, um, whether it's information about a new published paper or a new therapy that's come out, really gives you the opportunity to hear uh, every week about what's going on with the foundation and our, and our scholars and our community. Of course, don't forget to take the time to review the 2021 research webinar series. That five-part series is available on our website and uh, it's a plethora of information from our scholars, from our members of our scientific advisory board and really helpful break, breaking down what their research is and uh, what we have to look forward to. Also make sure to mark your calendar for the 2022 webinar series. Those will start uh, on October 5th and continue throughout the month. Uh, registration will be open in the September, October timeframe and we'll make sure to send that all to each of you. They are recorded so if you aren't able to make it, don't worry, they'll be available for free for you to listen at any time. Um, it's a great, great opportunity to ask questions and hear firsthand from all of our scholars as well about all of the great work that they're doing and what, what really each of their projects are. And so I'll take any other questions that have come in. And if not, I will say to you all, thank you. We appreciate all that you do and are so grateful for your continued support. Again, congratulations to our current and alumni scholars on the call. A thank you to our board of directors and to our scientific advisory board members and all of those who continue to invest their time in the organization. I look forward to talking with you all soon. And if you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much.